So uh, First John, uh, we're picking back up right where he left off. He opened it up for us and he let us see that, the, uh, that John's not trying to introduce something new. He's, he's just reiterating or restating things that are, uh, have, have always been believed by the church. He's not coming up with new and novel doctrines. and He's not trying to teach the church some, some new thing. Instead, he just wants to reorient them around the truth of the gospel. He is confronting false teachers that have come up from within the church, and he's seeking to address those issues. This morning, we're going to move from the introduction or the prologue of the letter into the body of the letter, and we're going to be looking at the first of two phrases that John uses as a framework for this whole letter. It, God is light and God is love. Those two statements of God's nature become the framework for all that John is going to teach us and challenge us with and, and reorient us around. These, they, they, they become the framework for everything he's going to do, for the, for the truths he affirms, for the conduct he advises, and for the assurance of salvation that he proclaims. These two truths, God is light, God is love, become foundational for that. Today we're looking at God is light. We're going to be picking up in verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5 of 1 John. We'll read it, we'll pray, and then we'll jump in. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we, have, if, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Father, without you sending your son, without your son proclaiming this message and even securing this message by his life, death, and resurrection, there'd be no reason for us to, to gather here at all. We, we wouldn't have anything to do. So thank you for your word. Thank you for this message. I pray, Father, that, that as we walk through this letter, that you would uh, work among us. As much as we talk about the gospel, as much as we seek to affirm the gospel and its truth, the Father, there's not a place, there's not a, a people, there's not a, a person in and among your people that can't grow in their faith, in their understanding, in their application. And so would you help us today? And in these weeks ahead, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I meant to say this before I got started with this. I would encourage, I, may, maybe you won't read it every day, but while we're through, going through this, there's going to be 19 weeks of study through, the first, through, through this first book of John. Uh, we'll take a break for Advent, but there will be 19 weeks that we're going to walk through this. We've done one, this is two, so there's 17 left. Let me encourage you, read through it weekly at least once. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, read 1 John, the whole thing. And, and I, I guarantee you, by the time that we're done, it, it will be so deeply entrenched in you that you will be transformed by it. You will not feel like you've wasted your time. It will prepare you and, and make you more ready to sit in these sermons. Um, but it's God's word that does the work. It's what we believe. We say that a lot. I say that a lot. I believe it. And while I, I'm going to work hard to teach it and proclaim it and, and, and bring, uh, ex exposit from it or explain it, there's no substitute for you sitting with the Spirit being led in His Word. And so, so it's a short letter. It would be easy to, to read two or three times a week to sit down and read it and let God do His work. Give Him the opportunity through His work to, or through His Word to do His work. All right. So 1 John 1, 5 through 10. John's message isn't new. This is the message we have heard from him. That he, he's not trying to come up with something new. He's not trying to state some new doctrine. He's not trying to give them some new thing to hold on to. He's saying, listen, this is what we heard. And this is what Jesus sent us to proclaim. And that's why we're here doing what we're doing. 
when was, why John's writing what he's writing. And we live in a world that's always looking for a better way, looking for a new solution, looking for that next great thing that's going to solve our big problem. We look for solutions everywhere, all over the place. We look for solutions politically. Maybe you've already begun to hear it. I mean, it happens to be election season. Both candidates have, have ads that are floating around. If, I, if you've avoided them, Lord bless you. I mean, I, help me know how you did that. Maybe you just don't interact with Facebook or any kind of media at all. But if, if you have avoided them, then, then that's great. But, but if you haven't, you likely have heard at least one, if not both, both are saying it. If you elect the other guy, all that America stands for is lost. Because they have the plan that's going to solve all our problems. What level of arrogance does it take for a man to stand in front of the country, for a person to stand in front of the country and say, I've got the plan that's going to fix everything. But man, we, that, that's the new religion. Like that is everywhere we look. Politically, we look for solutions. Legally, we look for solutions. When bad things happen, we write a law. We make a regulation, right? Like somebody gets hurt, we write a law about that. When I was a kid, I didn't have to ride in a car seat. In fact, we had fun bouncing around in the back of my mom's big green station wagon. It didn't have carpet on the floors. It was a metal floor. And so when she went around to like, turn really fast, we slid from one side, to the, one, one side to the other. When we rode to church when I was a little kid, when we rode to church on Sunday mornings in the front of my dad's pickup truck or, or his El Camino, the kids, the big kids would be lined up across the back. My mom and dad in the, in the front seat, in the only seat. And, and the big kids stuffed behind the back and my, myself and my littlest brother in, in the front seat. Can't do that today. Because people got hurt, so we wrote a regulation. I'm not saying all of these are bad. I'm just trying to prove a point. We've got a regulation now. Our kids have to sit in car seats, booster seats, until they're like 12 or something like that, until they're at least big enough to, to be held by the seat belt. Because by our regulations, by our laws, we're seeking to solve a problem. People die. Now, our solution is to make a law about it. Somebody gets shot, so we write laws about guns. Somebody does drugs, so we law write laws about drugs. And then we realize those laws don't actually fix anything. So we write more laws. We try to fix more problems. In fact, just recently, I, I heard a guy he had an answer to the drug problem in America. His answer to the drug problem, super intellectual guy, smart guy. I, I agree with him about a lot of things. I don't agree with him about this necessarily, but... But his answer to the drug problem is get rid of the laws against them. Just make them all legal. You remove the problem. Nobody goes to jail. You're not filling your jails with people who are doing drugs. You've got those people out on the streets and they're just wasting their life. And, and in his estimation, it eventually takes care of itself. So maybe the answer isn't more laws. Maybe the answer is no laws. We seek the solution legally. We seek solutions sexually. I want to be careful. I know we're in a different setting than we often are when I preach, and I want to be cautious, but this is a big one. A massive. We're surrounded by it. Our culture saturated with it. You can't drive down the street without seeing things that, that would be inappropriate. I was having a conversation not long ago with, a, uh, with Caleb, um, and we were talking about Noah coming out of the ark and getting drunk and his son seeing him naked and how... Because he saw his father naked and didn't seek to do anything about it, but went out and talked about it, he gets cursed. There's obviously something off when we can see half-naked people on billboards driving through town. When we feel completely comfortable with little kids running around and half-dressed. Netflix now has a show promoting this. I'm sure you've seen information about it. A lot of times we don't like to talk about this stuff. We keep it under wraps, you know. We don't want anybody to find out because we recognize it's kind of shameful. But then there are those of us who are looking for that solution sexually and we, we wear our sexual identity as a badge of honor. We look for solutions socially. If I get the right set of friends, if I have the right uh, 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 a job, the right degree, the right amount of entertainment in my life, the 
the, the right voices speaking in. And this is one I've heard a lot lately. Like, if you don't like what people are saying, just cut them out. Just get rid of them. Because you don't want the conflict. And obviously, if they don't agree with you, they must be wrong. So get them out. Let them go. We seek these solutions all around us. Everyone knows something is wrong. And everyone knows that they're, they're, there's an answer. And they're all looking for that answer. And John... John, man, he wants the church to know. He wants the church to see. He wants the church to hear again that we have the answer. Look no further for a solution. Our assurance, our peace, our joy, our fellowship with God and one another are found in the same message that Jesus made known to John and the same message that John is now making known to the church and the same message that we're going to sit and we're going to study for the next 17 weeks. This is the solution. This is the message. He's repeating this message to them to affirm the truths that false teachers are denying in their false gospels. And make no mistake, make no mistake, we're not done with false teachers. They're all around us. They're they're coming up from within the church, promoting other doctrines and other additions to the gospel and other ways to to, to form and unify around some new truth or some smaller truth. And there's some outside the church. It's almost like they're throwing stones and trying to di- distract and divert attention. He's repeating this message to them to assure them in their faith, to the, the, to, to, to assure them of their salvation. I mean, just imagine how, how precious this would be to be able to grow confident in your salvation, to be able to know with certainty. I mean, imagine knowing with certainty, with confidence, that you are secure in Christ. To know that you have been Saved That in this moment right now, you are safe. And in the future, when Jesus returns, you will be saved. How precious is that? To know this message, to understand this message, to believe this message that provides not just, not, not, not just truth, but assurance. He wants them to know it. He's repeating this message to them to, to advise them of how to conduct themselves now that they are saved. And we, we don't have to live righteously to get saved. That's not the gospel. That's not the message he's going to lay out. We don't have to earn our salvation. But if we have been saved, if we are secure in our salvation, John tells us, he's going to show us, he's going to advise us to conduct ourselves in a certain way because he knows that it's in this place, in, in obedience to these truths, that we find our greatest sense of joy and our greatest sense of fellowship. See, for a lot of us, a lot of Christians today, our, our problem is not the knowledge of doctrine. It's the believing it so deeply that we actually live it obediently. See, we, we struggle with the assurance and we struggle with, not because we've not heard it taught, not because we don't understand it, but because we're still wrestling with how to live our own way. John says, if, we'll, if, 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 these things, if these things will come together, we'll, we'll, we'll know our greatest sense of joy and fellowship and obedience to the things that we know are true. In the verses that we just read, he's jumping into this message that we've heard from Jesus, and he opens a statement about God. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, God is light. Now, I, I just, I, I've got I've plenty to say about all of this, but... But I, before I go there, I just want to say something. If we are not, if, if we're believing a message, let me say it like this. If we are believing a message that does not start with God and his nature, and it's centered on you and on me, and it's people focused and just makes us feel good about life and doesn't confront us with the truth of God's nature, that's the wrong message. That's a false gospel. We don't start on our experience. We don't start on our identity. We don't start with our, our, anything about us. We start with God. This message is about God. 
It's centered on him. It extends from him. It's about him. It's showing him. It's making him known in this world. This message is his. And we just happen to be people who get to hear it and be beneficiaries of it. God is light. This is the message. God is light. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean that God is light? Like, there's a lot of ways that this analogy could work out, right? In his commentary on John's epistles, the late, great John Stott, uh, he was an Anglican priest and theologian. He noted just how comprehensive this statement is. He, he, He wrote this in his commentary. Of the statements about the essential being of God, none is more comprehensive than God is light. It is his nature to reveal himself as it is the property of light to shine. And the revelation is of perfect purity and unutterable majesty. Beyond the commentaries and the comments that theologians have made, we can look at the analogy across the scriptures. For example, Psalm 119.105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This is representation of God's truth in God's word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In in Isaiah 5.20, a representation of light and darkness as as good and evil or good versus evil. Isaiah 5.20 reads, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. John used this illustration or this analogy repeatedly in his own gospel account so in John chapter 1, 4, we see it representative of Jesus and the mission he came to accomplish. In him was life. In Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. And while, it, while, while, while there's a number of ways that we could go and, and, and see this, this applied or this analogy broken out across the scripture, and while it may mean more than what we're going to say today, I can tell you, based on the context, it means at least four things. I think based on the context, at least four things. God is completely pure, not defiled. God is completely pure, not defiled. John doesn't just state God is light, but he gives us the counter perspective. There is no darkness. And and by the way, he writes it in the original language. It's not quite as, as obvious in the English, but in the original language, he sets it up with these two negative statements. There's absolutely no light, or, or sorry, there's no absolutely no darkness in him. He is only light. He's emphasizing the reality that there is pure light. It's all there is in him. He is only light. He is absolutely pure. Second, I would say that it, it helps us see that God is absolutely good, not evil. We, we get to see this as, as, as the context unfolds in verses 6 through 10. We see repeatedly John laying out the difference between living sinfully and living righteously, walking in the light and walking in the darkness, sin or no sin. He's, he's laying this out. And so, so there's a recognition we, we, we can uh, imply or understand that in the context, we can see that God is absolutely good and not evil. Everything God does is good. Everything about him is good. He, maybe you've heard the call and response statement. I don't, I don't even remember where I first heard this, but I hear it every so often. Uh, now I'm going to mess it up. God is good all the time. That's it. Yeah, see, God is good all the time. All the time. God is good, right? So that's the reality. This isn't a watered-down, emotional, make-you-feel-good-for-a-moment kind of goodness. It's measured by God's goodness, His standard of goodness. It's not measured based on how we feel about a situation. You hear people say it all the time, oh, God is so good. And what follows that? I got the job I wanted, the promotion I needed, the pay raise I felt like I deserved, the the car I wanted, the house I've been working for, you know, all these things. Things went my way. God is good. What about when things don't go your way? Like I know the stories of of 95% of the people sitting in this room. What happens when it doesn't go your way? He's always good. Always good. 
God is good even when we don't get the promotion, even when we don't get the job, even when we don't get the race or the new house or the car or the spouse we're trying to find or whatever it is that we think must be had. God is always good. He is never evil. So God is pure, God is good, and God is unquestionably true, not false. God is unquestionably true, not false. Again, you look in the context and you see this, this, this wrestling between what's true and what's a lie. What's, what's believable and what's unbelievable. What, what's, uh, well, true and, and not true. See, in God, there is no deceit. There's nothing false in him. He doesn't say one thing and mean another thing. He lives truth and he sets the standard for truth. And that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's massive in a world that's constantly talking about, well, this is my truth. Well, I don't care about your truth. No, that, that means that's too harsh. That's too harsh. I do care about your truth because I'm going to look for the lie in it so that I can tell you the truth of what God says. We just walked through a whole thing with our leaders over the course of about eight weeks dealing with trying to help us as a church understand how to engage in race and racism and, and some of the struggles we had and, and, and the stuff that's happening in the culture around us. And, and the reality is we spent two weeks talking about lies being told inside things like critical race theory and the organization Black Lives Matters. You heard me a couple weeks ago say black lives matter. There's absolutely nothing wrong with affirming the truth that a black life matters as much as a white life, that a white life matters as much as a black life. We are equal standing before God. But that organization is godless. And they are standing on lies and they are promoting a unity that will no bring nothing but destruction. And so in critical race theory and the black lives matter organization, there are a number of lies and we walk through them not to bring condemnation because it's not an us against them war. It's an us for them going and speaking truth into their lives so that God's truth can be heard. God is unquestionably true, not false. There's nothing false in him. He is faithful in his actions. He always acts in accordance with truth. He fulfills the promises he makes. Everything about God is true. There's not even a fraction, not even a little bit of deceit. To summarize it all, I would say it this way. God is holy, holy. I picked that on purpose because I like that. He is holy, holy. I think it was first R.C. Sproul who I first heard note that the angels surrounding the throne of God in Revelation weren't crying out, love, love, love. Lord is the Lord God Almighty. And while we might have a verse, and we're going to study it in 1 John, that says God is love, there's not a place that speaks so emphatically of his nature than this moment where the angels gather around his throne and cry out, holy, Holy, holy. He is absolutely distinct, light from darkness. There is no mixing, and darkness can't reside where light is. It is chased away, it is consumed and eaten up. God is holy, holy. He is pure in his essence and nature. He is good completely. He is true through and through. And if we are believing any message that doesn't start in this place, if we are listening to any teacher teach some message that doesn't start in this place, we have got the wrong message and we are listening to the wrong teacher. Well, why does it matter that God is light? Now that we know what it means, why does it matter? Well, the rest of the context of this passage helps us answer that question. And you're going to see it. John's going to answer. He's, he's going to lay out three false claims. In light of the fact that God is light, John's going to lay out three false claims and confront them with two central truths and realities to this message. The first, I would, I would, I would just claim, I would, not just claim, I would, I would say the reason that 
him being light matters? Well, first and foremost is because this is the message that's been told to us from Jesus. Let's just say that. Like I, I'm going to add to that, but with hesitancy, because I don't know that there's much more to say. Right? This is the message. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. The problem is that induces a problem. Because I'm not light, and in me there is darkness. And in you there is darkness. How in the world? So why does it matter? Because by his light, because by his light, we can finally see our sin honestly. Let's look at these three false claims. We'll see it in verse 6 and verse 7 and verse 9. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Look at the lie there. That's not true. There's nothing true about that. There's no, there's no reason for us to be able to turn around and walk around and say and, and live in sin and act like we're Pretending like we got some relationship, some fellowship, some partnership with God. Well, Christians, we may struggle with sin, but we can't just deem it acceptable. We can't live in a way that his word calls us not to live and act as if it's no problem. We can't, we, we, we can't sanctify our sin. We can't determine that it's acceptable to God. And, oh, you know, God's grace will take care of that. It's no big deal. It's no big deal that I'm sleeping around with my spouse. It's no big deal that I'm cheating on my tests at school. It's no big deal. God's grace is enough. You cannot walk in darkness and claim fellowship with the light. That is a lie. We'll struggle with sin. I got no doubt of that. But a struggle is a lot, a lot different than just wallowing around in it and demanding that God's grace be sufficient. The second false claim, he, he says in verse, se uh, verse uh, 7, no, I'm sorry, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin, so now we're not, we're not trying to minimize the activity of sin, we're trying to deny that we got any of it. <laughs> like, I don't know about the rest of these folks, but I don't have a problem. Like, is he talking to me? He's talked a lot about sin today. I don't, I think he's talking to everybody else. No, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. And anybody who's listening. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. The, the second's like it. In, in, in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, now this is interesting. The commentators and the, the people that know the Bible better than I do um, have a little debate about whether or not those are the same or whether they're slightly different. And they talk about the ways that they might be different. I, I'm in the camp that thinks, oh, he's really saying the same thing. And he's showing a different reality of that thing. So in the first one, he says, in verse 8, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So we're, we're, we're denying that we're sinful. And so we're walking around deceived, right? And the next one, he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, so there's two massive issues that we're struggling with and we don't even maybe realize it. If we're walking around minimizing our sin and pretending it's not that big a deal and it's not really, I don't really have a sin problem. Then you're deceived. You're lying to yourself. Not only that, you're lying about the God who is light. You are defaming his nature. The one who it just said God is light, you've just said no, he's not. That's a problem. It matters that we know this because now we can, by his light, as we stand in contrast to this holy God, this pure God, this good God, this true God. Now we can finally stand and now we can finally be honest. Now we can finally see the reality of the deepest problem we face. And it's not getting the right present. It's not finding the right spouse, not finding the right job, not getting the right set of circumstances. It is your sin. It is my sin. We are unacceptable in our own nature to a holy, righteous God. And that... First is terrifying. And even if you know the truth, and even if you know where I'm headed in these next couple of points, it, 
because of what you see in the passage. If that's where it ended, where would we be? It doesn't end there. See, once we know his light and we can see his and we can see our sin honestly. Once we see him in his purity and in his holiness and his goodness and his truth, we can finally see our sin honestly. And by his light, we can walk humbly and not hypocritically. Look at this. Look at, look at what he says. So, so there's three false claims. If we walk in the if if we walk in the light. Or if, I'm sorry, if we walk in the darkness and we say we're in the light, we can't have fellowship. If we say we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Those are three false claims, three false gospels, three false ways to live. I'm in verse 7, but, but, this is massive, this is important. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we step into the light, if we, if we look at the terror that it is to see our sin in light of who God is, and we step into the light, we're honest about our issues. Verse uh, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We step into the light and we say, God, I am a sinner. I don't deserve you. I can't earn you. I'll never be able to pay you back, but would you forgive me? Maybe it doesn't have to be that animated. Maybe it just needs to be simple. We step in the light and we walk in the light and we confess our sin. We agree with him about our sin. We come to him in contrition. We no longer have to pretend anymore. We don't have to stand in front of him and say, Oh God, look at what I've done for you. Look at all these good works that I've worked up for you. We can be honest. We can agree with him. That's what confessing means. If the, the, the word confess, it, it points to the idea of, of speaking our agreement with God. Agreeing with him about our sin. We step out into that light Seeking his forgiveness. And you'll get it. You can walk humbly. Not walking into his presence. Demanding something from him. God I've done this for you. Don't you. I, I deserve this thing I want so bad. Look at all this other stuff I've done for you. What level of arrogance does it require for us to stand in his presence. And demand our life be easy. What level of arrogance does it require for us to stand in his presence and demand him to act a certain way or do a certain work because that's how we think it should go? This is the good God. This is the true God. This is the holy God. You see, this, this light, it enables us to walk humbly before him. This reality of his nature allows us to to stand before him in his grace, not because we think we've deserved it or earned it. And it, it keeps us from having to pretend for everybody else and walking around like the hypocrites, picking our, picking our chins up and looking down our noses at everyone because at least I'm not like these fools. Look at me, God, I'm so good. It's a good thing that I came along. If you're going to make the gospel worth it. No. We're all on the same level. Standing before a holy, righteous, pure, good, and true God. We deserve to be worms in the dirt. But when we've stepped into the light and when we've confessed our sin and we've agreed with him, he has lifted us up out of the miry clay, and he has put us on a solid rock. That's gratitude. That, 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 that spurns gratitude and, and adoration and worship. Why does his light matter? Because by his light, we can see our sin. Because by his light, we can walk humbly, not hypocritically. 
Because by his light, we can stand before God, hopefully. I, I love the way that, that, that John starts by using this, this, this extreme language to show us the purity of God. And then he uses universal language on the solution of God's, uh, the, the solution to our problem. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with, the one, with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son. Listen to this. It's not your walking in the light that, that makes you acceptable, that cleanses you. Right? Like, let's not, let's not get this mistaken. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. That's, not just, that's one another. One, uh, us with God, us with one another. There's fellowship in his people. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. The sin that we'd like to deny, the sin we'd like to ignore, the sin we'd like to minimize, God, through his son, by the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses it, washes it all away. So that when you stand there before him, you're no longer the worm in the dirt, the sinful, horrific, unacceptable person you would be apart from him. You are clean, white as snow, Forgiven of all sin. The sin of stealing that little piece of bubble gum from the store when you were five years old. The sins of adultery. Murder, hatred, and everything in between. Every one of them cleansed. You are made pure. Just like he is pure. In, in, in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us from all un, no, Nothing's left behind. There's no, no ounce, no, no inkling, no little, little bit left along the way. He is going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will make you holy like he is holy. He will make you pure like he is pure. He will make you righteous like he is righteous. Only a pure, only a true, only a good and holy God can provide a solution like this one. Because everything else is stained with sin. Everything else is, 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 is tainted. Everything else is fallen. Only a pure and holy God can provide the solution. I was reminded this week, earlier this week, of, of a parable that I think will illustrate this well. The difference of these two lifestyles. The one that, that seeks to minimize sin, that seeks to deny sin and, 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 and pretend that, that they don't have sin. And the one who recognizes their sin. Luke tells this story of Jesus telling a parable. And it's interesting, as he opens the parable... It says, Luke, Luke writes, Jesus told this parable to some people who thought too highly. Of and that's a paraphrase, but essentially that thought too much of themselves. And told a story of, of two men that went into the temple to pray, a Pharisee and a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood off by himself praying to God, look at me. I'm so thankful I'm not like the rest of these folks, like that tax collector over there, denying his own sin at the at the comparison of another sinful person, while touting his good works, I give, I, I fast, I pray, look at the things I'm doing. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He couldn't even look up and beat his chest. He's got, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says it was the tax collector that went home that day justified. Now, for you and for me, that, that doesn't seem that shocking, except that maybe we don't like tax collectors a little bit. But tax collectors in that day were thought to be the worst of the worst. The tax collector went home justified, not the Pharisee, not the one who looked on the outside as if he had it all figured out and looked on the outside and did all the right things. It was a bunch of false claims. But the tax collector, the outcast, the one who was recognized for his sin, Beating his chest, have mercy on me, O oh God, a sinner. 
And Jesus finishes that parable by saying these words, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Because of his light, we can see our sin honestly. Because of his light, we can finally walk humbly. Because of his light, we can stand before God, hopefully. Because the one who humbles himself before the Lord, the Lord will exalt. That's the message. That's the message that that Jesus came preaching. That's the message that Jesus sent John to proclaim. And that's the message that we're going to study. I want to close today just, just for a moment, just stopping to think whether I'm whether you're more like the Pharisee or more like the tax collector. I want you to think about the different messages you believe and have believed and what your life demonstrates about what you're believing. If you're believing a message that that begins with anything other than God's purity, God's holiness, God's goodness, God's truth, then, then you're believing the wrong message. If you're believing a message that says that you can live however you want and minimizes the seriousness of your sin and minimizes the consequences of your sin, then you're believing the wrong message. If you're believing a message that says you aren't a sinner, God must be a liar, then you're believing the wrong message. If you're believing any kind of message like this, let just hear my plea He. Don't leave this day. Don't don't walk away from this moment without trusting this one. If we walk in the light as he is in the light and we have fellowship with, with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you do these things, when you walk in this way, when you believe this message, you can be confident in this. God will forgive you. God will make you righteous and he will cleanse you from every ounce of unrighteousness. Let's pray.